Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for returning. We are going to pick up a second session here with Josh Del Sol, director of Take Back Your Power, which many of you saw last night. A round of applause if you saw that movie. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh Del Sol. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you again, everyone, for being here. This is an exciting time. I think for everyone and challenging. And what we're going to talk about today is um, is the smart meter issue, which uh, you are familiar with if you saw the film, you're here last night, or for those of you that are watching online, if you've seen the DVD or, or online. But um, first, just want to uh, thank Michael, uh, the, the host here and the building biology team. You guys are amazing. This place is unbelievable, this Islandwood uh, Resort Center. So I'm really thrilled to be here. But let's, let's dive in here and we'll see how much we can, we can cover. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is defining the smart meter problem. The next, I believe, and, and many that actually understand what's behind this issue, which seems innocuous, but once we understand it, we can see how much is connected and how, how it affects uh, very deeply all of our lives. Uh, I believe it to be the next major battleground for, for human versus corporate rights. This is something we can, as you see, when we get into the second half of this presentation, into the solutions, and the next phase of that, uh, we can really sink our teeth into and, and, and have, a, I, I believe, a tremendous impact and shift the balance of power back towards the people. So the, the first thing we need to do is define the problem. And the second thing, I'll, I'll highlight developments in the movement since Take Back Your Power was released uh, just about two years ago in September of 2013. And then we'll look at solutions. Is a meta solution possible? You know, once we understand the problem and the context and how all the dots connect and how uh, corporations and governments have been able to get away with uh, what they have been, how that's happened, you know, that will be part of the, the, uh, what's going to help us understand the possible solutions. And what, that's something that uh, I believe uh, uh, I'm quite excited about, to be honest. And the bigger picture. So, defining the smart meter problem. Why are smart meters being installed when there's so many issues and problems with, to do with the costs going up and privacy and surveillance and, and uh, hacking vulnerability and especially for many people, the health issue. And they're, they're, light, they're being, you know, catching fire, they're lighting on fire. Why is this happening? Why is it this, this um, seeming agenda continuing to roll forward despite so many people starting to stand up and, and, and put a stop to it? Well, the purpose of the smart, uh, smart grid and smart meters is data harvesting and surveillance of in-home activities 24-7. And here's a, a screen from the film. This is from Australia. Uh, detailed information is being shared with third parties, including government agencies, the short version. It's being confirmed from many sources in many different countries what's actually going on here, despite what utilities are telling us. This is from the Department of Energy, uh, 2010. Uh, personal details uh, about the lives of consumers, such as their daily schedules, uh, whether they're awake or at sleep, whether their homes are equipped with uh, alarm systems, whether they own expensive electronic equipment, such as plasma TVs, and whether they use certain types of medical equipment. This is another screen from Take Back Your Power. It's um, from a congressional research report from US Congress. With smart meters, police will have access to data that might be used to track residents' daily lives and routines while in their homes, including their eating, sleeping, and showering habits, what appliances they use and when, and whether they prefer the television to the treadmill, among a host of other details. So it appears there's an agenda, and it appears that agenda is actually linking with uh, the police force for unwarranted surveillance. That's what it appears so far. Okay, so this is from another screen from the film from, uh, and this is just kind of reviewing for those of you that have watched the film, we're gonna set the foundation first and then we're gonna dive in and include um, uh, many aspects of this issue. So three to 10 years strategic roadmap from uh, Massachusetts Grid uh, a Consulting Company. Uh, new tools for mining data in Intel. 10 years out, 10 plus years out, centralized Intel combined with widespread local distributed Intel and data mining and analytics. What does that sound like? you guys. I mean, like, when you're talking about smart grid, which is supposed to be for saving energy and helping the environment, it's being installed in the name of climate action. 
uh, it seems to be something else going on here. So this is a false solution being deployed in the name of climate action. This is a bait and switch on a massive level. And we're going to have um, uh, expert testimony from, uh, from uh, an a, a industry engineer who's calling this out uh, later on in this presentation. The commercial, now this is a very key point to understand, and this is actually, you know, if you understand this, it's kind of like an aha moment for many people. The commercial value of the surveillance data is uh, set to exceed the, the value of the electricity itself. And this is, this is not you know, me saying this or whatever. This is from politico.com. And this is experts, uh, smart grid experts, utility experts disclosing this information. So smart online power meters are tracking energy use and that data may soon be worth more than the electricity they distribute. And here's what the um, Miles uh, Keough, the director of grants and research at NERUC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners says. I think the data is going to be worth a lot more than the commodity that's being consumed to generate the data. So just confirming what the, the article started with. And obviously very sensitive information can be revealed about homes. So in case you were wondering, the global electricity market is 2.2 trillion. That's the value of the electricity that uh, the director of New Rock is telling us that the, the data harvested by smart meters will be a lot worth a lot more than 2.2 trillion. So um, in that same article now, this is interesting because at the bottom of the article, nice point to leave on here, right? It, uh, the solution is a ba basic uh, comprehensive data law in this country and it does not need to be based on notice and consent. So somehow this uh, proposed solution here uh, from this so-called expert is to not let you know what's going on and to, and to take away your rights of choice. And we're just gonna have, we're gonna pass a law and make it look good for everyone, and then continue to do the backdoor deals, the surveillance deals and all this, uh, these, these, these connections and things that are happening behind the scenes. So this is a, another example of a disclosure about what's going on and a false solution. So the, Another aspect of this is very, very key to understand. With a smart meter, the homeowner gives up control of access to essential resources, energy, water, and gas. And the smart meters are being installed for those uh, three essential resources. And uh, essentially, uh, sorry to overuse that word, but um, this is a key point here, that we lose control of that, those resources in our home. In other words, the utility or any hacker or anyone who gets access to the smart grid system, the smart grid network, can at the flip of a switch or a click of a mouse, can disable uh, ac that electricity to your house or that gas or that water to your house. This is what we're talking about here. We're talking about, for some reason, everything is being made vulnerable. Again, in the name of climate action. And all of the, the, the we're hearing on a daily basis now how our smart grid and the electricity grid is vulnerable to cyber attack. I mean, what's, what's going on here, right? Well, we kind of, we already see a lot of what's going on because of the, the, the value of the data. So there are no energy savings with the, these smart meters. And in fact, after a meter upgrade, homeowners often note inexplicable increases in electricity bill and their usage and cost. And here's an example, a uh, screen from the film again. 80% uh, of people are seeing increases, not decreases in their, in their bills. Uh, and along with a, uh, entirely new and unnecessary network infrastructure and data centers, the result is greater overall energy usage. So in the name of climate action, again, right? Uh, this is an unparalleled misuse of funds, and here's from Time Magazine in, uh, in 2012. After the election, the first thing that President Obama did was he suggested pouring 100 billion into a so-called smart grid. Let's just build it. <laughs> That's my Obama impression. Um, he told his transition team. And he ultimately settled for $11 billion in seed money, according to Time magazine. So what that meant, and we all know how we're starting to get a feel for how he feels about surveillance, right? He's kind of saying that the NSA and all of the surveillance that they're doing is warranted. So California spent $7 billion on its smart grid project, of which um, unnecessary meters is the main cost. 
And utilities very often receive government incentives up to $200 million uh, per utility in the USA to deploy. So this is where that $11 billion figure comes in. So up to $200 million per utility. And Pico in Pennsylvania is one of those utilities. Centerpoint in Texas, many other utilities are getting this money, $200 million, as a carrot dangling on a stick. But they only get it if they install smart meters. So there's thousands of home fires and explosions, another massive issue to do with this. Uh, Fire-prone smart meters have been replaced in Pennsylvania, Saskatchewan, Oregon, Florida, Arizona, and Ontario, Canada so far. Not just the ones that burned, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of them. They're not underwriters' laboratories approved in most cases. They're not tested. They're made out of plastic. They're not made out of glass and metal. They're flammable. And they're being installed under load without shutting off power. So when the utility is coming to install these upgraded, you know, modernized meter, they're, they're like literally you know, not even turning the breaker off. They're not asking you to turn your appliances off. They're just taking the, the, the old meter out and putting in the new one. And in many cases, that's causing fires and damage immediately. Um, and here's an example. I'll, I'll qualify this. At the bottom of the, the, that last line, the end of the last line, generally incompetent te uh, temp workers. Okay, well, let me qualify that claim. Here's a, a Craigslist ad in Sarasota, Florida, Florida uh, looking for an electricity meter installer. And the pay sheet is $2 per meter, and the average installer to complete 90 to 100 meters per day. Right? So if we, so if we say that, let's say we get somebody really you know, gung-ho on this uh, who, who gets the job, and um, 120 meters a day, that works out to four minutes per meter installation. Yeah, plus dry, that doesn't even include them getting around to the next house. So they're slapping these things on. And as far as the, the uh, requirements, we're not talking about uh, you know, licensed electricians here. We're talking about cheap temp workers to go out and do dirty work for criminals. Must be a high school graduate, you know? Like, so anyway, and paid training will be provided. So they actually, in the average uh, training period, is two weeks. So what's happening? There's deaths from smart meters in Reno, Nevada, California, Texas, Michigan, Connecticut, etc. cetera. Uh, here's Larry Nickel in California. He uh, died in, in 2010 from a smart meter fire. Here's um, James Humphrey, earlier this year, died from a smart meter fire. And here is Michelle Sherman, 61-year-old woman in Nevada, died from a smart meter fire. And, and this one, oh, we finally have the fire chiefs looking into this and saying, oh, you know, we gotta do a, we gotta do a pro, we gotta check this out. You know, finally someone with, with some backbone. I mean, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, if you've been following this. Uh, this one in, in Michigan, they actually escaped the house, but their two dogs died in the blaze. Uh, investigators are still working to determine the cause, but the people who live in the house insist the smart meter is to blame. This, here's an interesting thing. This woman is kind of a se semi-celebrity, uh, Madonna Badger in Connecticut. And she was interviewed by Matt Lauer on NBC News, and she says that, um, I don't believe that what the official story is, why my house burned down. There's something going on. This was a, let's see, is that 2012? So that was Christmas Day 2011 that that happened. So Stanford State Attorney General, or State State's Attorney David Cohen concluded that the fire was most likely caused by the disposal of fireplace ash in the early hours of Christmas morning. And she said, I don't believe that the ashes caused, caused the fire. And what else did she see? After she climbed out the window during the incident, she s said she saw sparks from near the edge of the house to her left, her house. Smoke was coming from the area where the electricity meter is located. And this is, this is great, you'll love this. A, a major source of her skepticism is the fact that her house was ordered by city officials to be torn down a day after the fire before a forensic investigation could be conducted. To this day, if, if anyone watching this video knows this woman, have her watch this, please, because to this day, she's under the impression that you know, she still doesn't know what caused the fire uh, because she was traumatized and has apparently given up, given up her quest to find out. So, 
And if you click on that link, that right above the yellow part, this is what you get. So we can't see anymore her complaints and her, her side of the story from NBC. But this isn't the only time this has happened. In Quebec City, firefighters are asking Hydro to Quebec to leave smart meters alone. And after there's a fire incident, which there are multiple in Quebec, just like everywhere else, uh, utilities are actually taking the meters away before the investigation. Quebec City's fire uh, department says Hydro-Quebec has been too quick to remove smart meters from the scenes of a fire where faulty wiring might be an issue. So it's the faulty wiring that's causing the issue according to um, uh, utilities and according to much of the corporately controlled media. Um, a department spokeswoman uh, of the fire department says a fire is considered a crime scene and that a crime scene evidence should be left alone. Duh. <laughs> But the utility says the meters belong to the public utility and meters don't cause fires. It's just like they'll keep repeating this, meters don't cause fires. Um, however, you know, places like Saskatchewan and others have had you know, individuals that have had a backbone and have st stood up and said, no, we've got to take those things out. But because people are still unaware of this issue and uh, unaware of the depth and complexity and the importance, and the people are actually dying from these fires, their uh, utilities are often installing new smart meters, just a dip different kind, a different make of a smart meter, which is also fire prone. So we really need to get awake and active on this issue and, and demand the, the removal of these things. And we're going to talk about this later in the second half of the presentation. So even though Hydro-Quebec says the smart meters don't cause fires, they are moving every smart meter that is within three meters of a propane tank. They're moving that smart meter away at their own expense. Right? So what does that tell you? Well, the meters don't cause fires, but you know, they're all burning and we need to move them away from, from the propane tank. And, you know, <laughs> uh, coincidence, right? The Hydro-Quebec CEO uh, resigned amidst this or just kind of before this all came out and his t two top uh, smart meter officials just resigned in one day. Okay, so the next half of the, the problem here, I want to get into the health issue a little bit, which many of you here in person are very, uh, you know, experienced about, and there's expert presenters um, that I won't get into too much of the wireless aspect because there's expert presenters here, Martin Paul, uh, Peter Sullivan, and I believe Michael, um, Schwabe. Michael Schwabe is presenting, what, I'm sorry? And Peter Sirk. And Peter Sirk. So uh, I do want to get into the fact that, you know, first of all, health issues are reported everywhere meters are installed. And this isn't just one region, this isn't just like an isolated incident. This is happening everywhere. There's two issues going on here. There's a pulsed microwave radiation that the meters give off, and there's the voltage transients or the dirty electricity. So here's um, an actual study on, specifically on smart meters that was released last November. 92 residents of Victoria, Australia, or the, the subjects, and the, uh, the most frequently reported symptoms from exposure were insomnia, headaches, tinnitus, ringing in the ears, uh, fatigue, cognitive disturbances, abnormal sensation, and dizziness. And um, just if you continue on there, the effects of these symptoms on people's lives were significant, and they match up the, the symptoms that have been reported in thousands of studies previously released. Um, and uh, most of these individuals that experience these, these symptoms, because not everybody feels it, not everybody has the symptoms. Everybody shows it in their blood work and in other lab tests, but very, a small percentage still feel it in the actual physical symptoms. Um, but um, most of them were not sufferers of what they're calling electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome before that uh, the smart meter was installed. So they were fine with other aspects of wireless, which it says here, the may, smart meters may have unique characteristics that lower people's threshold for symptom development. So there's something else going on, why so many people are, are having functional impairments. So um, we'll let that wireless issue be more uh, discussed by the other experts here, but I want to talk about power line carrier smart meters, or PLC. Now these are being offered by increasing the uh, number of utilities to, uh, to be a so-called solution to the people that don't want meters that pulse wireless radiation uh, every few seconds. But the reality is that um, and they transmit sending signals uh, along the power line, 
Uh, but the reality is that these systems create significant levels of dirty electricity on the household wiring and the power lines outside people's houses. That's higher uh, in many cases than the standard wireless smart meter. So the electrical wires in homes and businesses, as well as the power lines, are not designed to carry communication signals. I mean, we were building, in this country and many others, a fiber optic network, and now we're, you know, like, what, how, what happened there? So the wires are becoming giant transmitting antennas. For, in, like, throughout the home, the wires in the home are becoming giant transmitting antennas, and as a result, you know, they're, they're causing uh, health issues just like wireless smart meters are. So here's, um, after the installation of a power line smart meter, I started experiencing ringing in the ears, again, bloody nose, sleeping uh, issues. There are times I feel I'm swirling around, uh, uncoordinated jerky movements, and my nerves began to shake. You know, and, and you can just read the rest there. Concentration and rashes, heart palpitations. Another um, report from someone else. Two weeks after the installation, a high-pitched buzz starting in my ears. Uh, several months later, I noticed a weakness, a tremor, and then this individual um, tells about how, you know, that's an alignment with how Parkinson starts. So another one and from Australia. Since the EM1000 um, PLC smart meter was installed, I get extreme electrical fields throughout my home. So this individual is actually measuring the fields, and you can get devices that measure the fields. Um, there is 1,000 volts per meter. My tinnitus screams all night as the meters are turned on from 11 p.m. and continue all through the night. So here's some more. You know, the noise is very disturbing. Uh, pins and needles. Uh, my brain is burning, it feels like. I've never had this before. Insomnia, rapid heartbeat, disoriented. So this, so this is just an example of, of a, a small select group of the individuals that are having health issues from PLC smart meters. Again, another false solution. Uh, just earlier this week, I reached out to Sophia Health Institute, which is um, D Dr. Dietrich Klinghart's. Um, uh, practice in Woodenville, Washington, and he's featured in Take Back Your Power, and he's uh, one of the foremost practitioners and, uh, and doctors on the planet for helping people uh, really get better from having, you know, these kind of symptoms. How can they recover health from having electromagnetic radiation poisoning or whatever your, your, your term for it is? Um, and here's what Dr. Christine Schaffner, who, is, who works very closely with Dietrich, she just emailed me a couple days ago. And she mentioned these five things. If you want to take note of this, this is what's working for them, for their, um, for their patients. And uh, uh, she, she did say the patient number is, in, uh, is increasing to do with uh, radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation illness. So if just from the film... I'm sorry? Okay, I'm sorry. So I don't know, actually, I'm not directly familiar with this. This is just copied and pasted straight from the email that she sent. So BioPure Rosemary Tincture, BioPure Green Brazilian Propolis, uh, Sleep san Sanctuary or EMF Canopies that go over your bed, Locasana Grounding Mats and Semina Beds, and um, I believe Peter Sullivan here has some new technology that uh, helps with grounding as well, and Heavy Metal Detox. So, um, in a conversation with, with Dietrich, he really is adamant that the heavy metals are really acting like antennae in the body and to, to pick up and to make the symptoms of electromagnetic radiation sickness worse. Okay? You can put this down here if you like. Okay, thank you. So this is from Take Back Your Power. This is the live blood cell um, clip. I just wanted to review with this. While industry has failed to do any peer-reviewed studies on smart meters and health effects, a growing body of independent research is now starting to accumulate. In our second set of tests, we're using the smart meter. Before the exposure, we see the same thing as we saw in the first samples. Normal cell walls, fairly separated and looking healthy. So after two minutes of exposure in front of the smart meter at about one foot away, we see a totally different story. Sample one, you can see a lot of degradation in the cells. The cell walls have been broken and you see changes in the cells which are called mycoplasma. It shows a mutation to the cell. 
In the second sample, we see a different type of degradation to the cell membranes. You can see a corrugation here. This is called bottle cap formation, and it's known that this occurs due to oxidation or uh, exposure to free radicals. So this third subject, uh, when we did her sample, she had to be pulled away from the meter after 45 seconds because she complained about an increasingly severe headache. And here you see a phenomenon called rouleau, where the red blood cells are stacking up, which makes it very difficult for the blood to deliver oxygen to the tissues as they would be their normal function. Every single one of these is a degradation. Every single one of these shows a trauma to the blood cells and that came from something and the only variable was the smart meter. Okay, so how is it <clears throat> that in our science, in our civilization, the basic building blocks of human life, the red blood cell, doesn't count? But this does. So science is ignoring what's happening to the human body and its basic components. And what they're doing, this, not all of science, but the, the agencies, the industry side of this, and the industry is absolutely controlling the FCC and all major countries' health industries, or industries supposed to be governing health. So what they look at, here's an example of, uh, and most of you in this, in this room are familiar with this, a device or a radiation source has to actually increase liquid in a plastic dummy head by a certain number of degrees in a certain period of time in order for that radiation source to be deemed unsafe. So they're not actually looking at what's happening in the human body. They're looking at if liquid in a plastic dummy head increases in temperature. So the current state of science, what, what does this mean? I mean, are there people speaking out against like what's happening with this industry, massive industry bias in, uh, bias in science? Here's what Dr. Richard Horton says, and he is the current editor-in-chief of The Lancet. The case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analysis, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with an obsession to pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn toward darkness. And I think that's obvious, becoming obvious to many, many people. And we're having, obviously, people in positions of authority now that, you know, The Lancet is one of the most well-respected um, medical journals um, say this. So getting back to our main um, slide set here about defining the problem. Symptoms are uh, considered uh, consistent with those found in 5,000 or more studies on electromagnetic radiation. And one example that I really like is this website here called um, justproveit.net slash, slash studies. So anyone can go to that website. There's 5,000 studies right there that show harm from electromagnetic radiation, non-ionizing radiation at levels below what industry considers safe. <clears throat> so radiation pulses typically uh, are at least hundreds of times stronger with a smart meter than an active cell phone. All right, so here we are in Kauai. That's a KIUC smart meter. KIUC, three watts. And it's transmitting at approximately 10 times higher than an ITRON smart meter. We're here next to Pat's taco stand in Hanalei on Kauai. And here we have my Cornet electrosmog device, which I will try to position it so that you can see the numbers. Okay, there's the numbers. It's approximately one foot away. Okay, so there it is, approximately one foot away. There's the meter, there's the device. I'll hold it in about the same spot. And there you can see the numbers. This is about one foot away. We just had a spike at 480,000 microwatts per meter squared. That's 480.7 milliwatts per meter squared. And you can see that clearly in the max uh, peak value at the bottom. It's emitting multiple times per minute right now. Let's, let's see how long before the next minute. I don't really want to stand here anymore. 
480,000 is actually 480 times higher than the building biology guidelines for extreme concern. 364,000, a second spike right there. Less than, clearly less than a minute away after the one following. That's 360 times higher than the threshold set by building biology for extreme concern. This is one foot away from the meter. I actually got readings of, of 600 uh, microwatts per meter squared, about 20 feet away from this meter and behind uh, two trees. And that's 60% of the value of, of extreme concern, 20 feet away from the meter. 539,000 microwatts per meter squared. There you can see meter. The Electrosmog ED75 device, approximately 12 inches away from the front of the face of the meter. This is an extreme uh, concern according to peer-reviewed published science and the, the, the misinformation and the disinformation about this issue simply has to stop. Utilities have been lying about the power output. This is again a 3 watt transmitter and it is at levels multiple times higher, hundreds of times higher than the, le than the levels which are known to damage health according to published science. The FCC guidelines are irrelevant. The FCC was never mandated to deal with health, anything to do with biological health, and it's time that people wake up about this issue. So here we are, by comparison, we're going to look at how much radiation a cell phone puts out when it makes a call. Just a normal call, you can see AT&T, three bars, and the higher the number of bars, the lower the power output of any cell phone. So this is an average call, not even a very good connection, it's going to put out more than, an av well, more than, than many cell phone calls. Let's see how much radiation uh, happens when we call my phone, so go ahead and and call and there we see a spike to 0.9 and 1.6 was the highest it spiked just around the time and then another spike to 0.9 so here we have and this is about this is actually closer if you look at it it's within 12 inches so it's actually about 10 inches away so that's closer than the smart meter test we did and it's in the range of 530 times less power output, less radiation. This is an active call. We're getting 0 0.05, 0 0.06, uh, 1.0. That translates to, um, uh, one, that 1 1.0 translates to 1,000 microwatts per meter squared. Whereas in the, with the smart meter, the KIUC 3 watt Landis and Gear smart meter, from the same distance away, it was 539 on this meter, or 539,000 microwatts. Okay, so our government agencies, the FCC, Health Canada, etc., are now 100% controlled by industry. And uh, it's essentially a revolving door between industry and the FCC, between industry and the FDA. You know, Monsanto and the FDA have a very, very cozy relationship, as many of you know. And uh, the, previous, uh, the previous senior executive at the, the telecom uh, lobbying group, the CTIA, is now the FCC chair. Uh, here's a new book. Make, make a note of this if you're interested in this, because it's an excellent new book promoted by Harvard by Norm Alster, and you can get that at bit.ly slash captured agency. And that uh, talks about how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industry. Okay, so, and as a result, UK, Canada, USA, Canada, and the UK have for example, 100 times higher levels of wireless radiation limits than Russia, China, Poland, Switzerland, Luxembourg, many other countries. Um, here's a, an example from the film. This is um, sped up a little bit, uh, double time. Um, but uh, what we're seeing here is, is an example of, I just you know pulled some uh, um, studies about wireless health effects. At what level of radiation are we seeing health effects and how does that compare 
to industry standards. There is the, the building biology or bowel biology guideline for extreme concern. That's 0.1. You know, at 1.0, we're seeing sperm DNA issues. And fertility is going down massively. And there's so much evidence now to indicate that uh, wireless radiation is a major culprit. And here's a smart meter. It's 7.93. That's an ITRON smart meter. In the video we just saw, the KIUC smart meter would have registered at, uh, was it 53.9 on here, one, one meter. And here's... Um, uh, those other countries, as mentioned, uh, another science study there, changes in behavior uh, from a 30-minute exposure. And here's um, ITRON meters, again, the lower level meters uh, emitting 19.8. Um, and that's in uh, microwatts per centimeter squared, so the numbers are a little bit different. And here's the kind of the USA standard, 600 to 1,000. That's what Actually, they consider. It's actually based on uh, research uh, from the 1960s that looked at thermal effects. Mm -hmm. So literally they had this, this dummy head, right? So think of this, you know, like in the car accident commercials where you have this dummy head yes. and it's filled with like a fluid. Mm -hmm. And the fluid has to go up by one full degree in order for something to be deemed unsafe. So what Health Canada is saying is that you have to cook the cells before any negative effects can happen. Okay, and we're, we talked about that previously. So the, what's the media doing? Well, the corporately controlled media, and not all media is bad, but the corporately controlled media is trying to tinfoil hat the entire issue and movement. So this is a surveillance agenda that's being installed in the name of climate action to gain, according to Naruk, a lot more than 2.2 trillion in value from that surveillance data. And that technology is harming everyone. There's a percentage of people that feel it. And what we're seeing is that they usually suppress anything linking the surveillance agenda in the mainstream media and smart meters. And in many cases, they're actually promoting the EHS novelty angle in a way that marginalizes those that are experiencing the symptoms. So this is, this is another bait and switch, and I really want to draw attention to this because there are advocates uh, for uh, you know, resolving this, this issue from wireless harm that are, <laughs> are, are promoting the disability status. Well, we need to have official recognition leading to official disability status for those experiencing electromagnetic hypersensitive syndrome rather than focus on the culprit that is causing the harm which is a 100% completely uh, you know, bought and paid for industry that does not care about people, they just care about profits. So that's what's happening here. And I re would really actually encourage you to be in touch with those advocates that are going in the angle of, of making, everyone, you know, making everyone who experiences this disabled. Because when you're officially registered as disabled, you're basically, I mean, you're kind of disempowered from that point and you're actually potentially part of the problem for everyone else to try to get uh, a remedy. You know, everyone else who won't go to the doctor and get a note so that they can have a smart meter removed, for example. Okay? I don't even want to ask for directions, <laughs> let alone, like, go to the doctor and be officially labeled as, as disabled. So really start to think how industry might be playing this angle a little bit here. That might be playing into their hands, going into that official, you know, disability status, rather than, you know, People need to really understand the cause of the problem and the extent of the harm. So most people, the problem, most people are still unaware of the health issue and are avid users and addicts of wireless tech. So they simply can't relate. They see a story in the New York Times uh, or a, a short film, which was actually very, quite well done. But it's released and talked about in such a way where people think, okay, well, maybe my cell phone is harming me, but I don't feel it. And, you know, that person with that shielding that walks around um, uh, in, in, society, in, 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 in the city with shielding around, they're, they're just weird, you know. So that immediately there's this barrier that comes up. Rather than seeing that, you know, we're all human beings, we all have the same biological makeup, we're all being affected, and some people are more electromagnetically aware at a biological level than others. So what are we doing with the canaries, right? The canaries who are the more sensitive people, the more people that are tuned into subtle uh, frequencies, we're marginalizing them. We're calling them disabled rather than waking everyone else up and saying, we've got to change the situation. 
But it's not all bad, because here, uh, this is a film called Look Up. It's a short film on YouTube uh, from last year, and it has 53 million views. And the whole film is about getting away from being addicted to wireless technology. This is the younger generation especially just ate this up, because we're starting to realize, even at a subconscious level, that you know, my life like this, and, and just addicted to my emails, and my texts, and my cell phone, and games, and everything wireless, it's not fulfilling. Right? Uh, there's something missing from my life. And this is a, a, I encourage you to go on YouTube and watch this. It talks about how you know, the, the, the subject in the, in, in the film missed meeting his mate in life, missed meeting his significant other because he was doing this. <laughs> so, so that's what we need to start bridging this awareness of the health issues. Not only are the tech, uh, wireless gadgets causing us a diminishment of enjoyment of life, but they're harming us biologically by default. So with smart meters, most are, or they are being installed without homeowners' knowledge or consent. And the so-called knowledge that utilities are providing are lies. So this, along with liability, is the utilities and government Achilles heel. We'll talk more about that later. So 55% of um, homes in the USA have so-called smart meters installed, and installations are happening worldwide. Most are, uh, however, are either unaware of the problem on one side, they don't know the issues with smart meters, or they're experiencing corruption overwhelm. And many are under the false impression that they have no remedy. You know, they've appealed to their city councils or to their utility. They're, maybe they're paying an extortive opt-out fee, which is actually charging people not to be subject to one of these on their house. Meanwhile, everybody else is around them. Uh, so people are not yet aware of an effective strategy pr for preventing and reversing installation. So what's our... What is our uh, effective perspective going to, going to be as we engage in this issue and as we deal with those who are causing us harm? Well, uh, a friend of mine, Kimberly Gamble, um, has this perspective. I thought it's so empowering. I'm a friend of your soul, whether it's the utility CEO or the city council or the mayor or whomever that doesn't understand this issue, but I'm an enemy of your project. So I, I'm, on, I'm on board with you in spirit. We're all in this together. Both of us want to do what's right, but we can't have that anymore. And we're going to hold you liable. So development since 2013, uh, September 2013, Take Back Your Power was released. We've screened uh, 200 plus uh, in communities around the world. Won three major independent awards, um, entirely grass grassroots word of mouth promotion. And thank you to everybody in this room who's helped us get that, that word out. Um, and you can watch it, for those uh, uh, perhaps watching at home, if you're not familiar with this issue, go to takebackyourpower.net and watch the film and you can really understand and you can download that, you can share it with your friends. And uh, in January 2014, Northeast Utilities, 3.5 million customer base in, um, uh, in New England had this to say and they actually broke ranks and they actually admitted this about smart meters. There is no rational basis for the implementation of AMI smart meters. Later in that legal document, is it, this is, I don't know if this is working. <laughs> the, the smart meter technology choice is made, although there is no evidence that this is a good choice for customers. And later on in that same document, there is no evidence that customers are willing to pay for the limited incremental functionality gained through the implementation of smart meters. And it goes on to say many, um, Let's see, for example, industry studies show that, if, uh, that only 46% of customers are aware of the concept of smart metering. And of that percentage, 33% associate smart metering with complaints of meter inaccuracy, higher customer bills, invasion of privacy, and health concerns. And they have a deep aversion to this technology that links them to the grid in a way that they perceive as an invasion of their privacy and are detrimental to their health. So some common sense from that particular utility. Now here is um, Dr. Timothy Sheckley. This is from a year and a half ago, and he let's just listen to his background. My name is Timothy Sheckley, um, Senior Research Fellow for the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy. Speaking from a background in understanding the, the role of, of energy management uh, going back into the 1980s, working with the utility companies and developing uh, energy management systems, and also, coincidentally, smart meters. The smart meters are a symptom of a dysfunction in the system. Um, 
What we need is a new energy economy, and the basic and my my case is that the basic elements for doing that are are before us, are happening very rapidly. The promise of the smart grid has been co-opted by the smart meter, and I call it a canard, a misrepresentation. Basically, it's a French word for duck, and it means decoy. The public pushback of we are seeing for smart meters is based on cost, on safety issues, health and safety issues, and on privacy. So what we need to do in order to really balance the grid is to get rid of baseload generation entirely and go entirely with renewables and the additional technologies, storage and, uh, and control technologies that I'll refer to uh, later in this talk, uh, to to balance that grid dynamically. And that takes a really smart, I hate to use the word smart, but a smart, a real smart grid, not one uh, that is uh, based on meters. The meters have absolutely nothing to do with it. I ran into a friend of mine who's a senior um, official in the Department of Energy, uh, research and development. And uh, we were having a coffee break at the conference, and he, um, uh, I walked, we, we said hi, and then uh, I said, uh, uh, he said to me, I, I saw your paper. <laughs> I just sent it out a week before. And I said, well, what'd you think? I figured I'd get a lot of pushback from all these guys at this conference. And he sort of gave me a, a sheepish grin, and he shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you know, we had a, a huge amount of money that had to be spent on, on uh, uh, smart grid, and uh, we didn't have anything off the shelf that would we could call smart grid except these meters that were designed 20 years ago. So uh, that's what we spent two billion of the four billion for smart grid. That's where it went uh, for uh, matching funds for utilities to put in smart meters. Uh, but he knew they didn't do what was supposed to be done. A critique of a high-level report was created by the office of the president on smart grid and. It just shows how the, the whole process has been captured by industrial interests and uh, what I call the electricity industrial complex. So what I'm advocating in the paper is power to the people, uh, distributed energy and local control, renewable and sustainable energy. And the new model is a service model. Let the customers generate the electricity. The utility just manages the wires and poles. That's the new business model. But that's tough, a tough one for a 130-year-old industry that's based on return on big capital and sell of kilowatt hours. Emerging issues. What's happened since we published a paper a, year, a little over a year ago? Um, what's changed? Well, there's a whole lot has changed, and it's amazing. There has been, uh, number one, an emerging privacy and security risk issue. I mean, that, that was around for a long time, but no one was sensitized to it. Now, all of a sudden, it's everywhere, all the time. Every, every day in, the new, in every newspaper, there's some reference to it. The continuous flow of documents that are, have come into um, the system and, and the whole sensitivity to privacy, the, the vast differences between Europe and the US regarding the concepts of privacy, um, that's all front row now. What, a year ago, it was not. Uh, these meters have a huge, huge privacy risk associated with them. Um, and that's described in the paper. Dramatically, uh, a second one, a th event has been the dr dramatic improvement in the economics of renewables. Just in the, a year, we've seen enormous um, improvement in cost of photovoltaics, intelligent inverters and, and chargers and, uh, that that make the rooftop solar work so much better. We, uh, solar panels are just as efficient in small scale as they are in large scale. There's no benefit in putting them in large farms, large, you know, concentrated facilities. They should be distributed all around. There's been a huge utility pushback on solar photovoltaics and net metering that Duncan referred to a few minutes ago. The, particularly in California, Arizona, Colorado, and other states, they're and, uh, driven by ALEC again, the American uh, Legislative Exchange Council, um, trying to uh, push back on renewable energy. That's new, and uh, because the utility industry is waking up to the 
uh, the death spiral in their business model. And they want to fend it off, at least until some of the top executives can retire. And also the P PUC regulatory regime is losing its, its uh, d legitimacy. Uh, uh, certainly in Colorado, ALEC is taking over. Uh, the governor has just appointed the, the head of one, a, a, a major uh, player in ALEC to be the, a, a member of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, to uh, wrap this up, uh, the merging issues, why, opt, uh, and there's this idea of opt out. Well, we, want, uh, we don't want a smart meter on our house, uh, let us out. We, you know, the Public Utilities Commission, some will say, well, you can, you can opt out, or you, can, uh, you have to pay, but you can opt out. I don't, opt out is not an answer. We, if, if, if you get rid of your meter, somebody's got one next door already. You've got to get rid of the whole network. And, uh, and this happened in Canada. I mean, there were some activists I was working with up there that said, well, you know, we, we, we won a victory. We got the local, the Public Utilities Commission to allow us to opt out. And I said, boy, you, that's divide and conquer. They just got rid of the, the, the people that were raising hell. So, you know, that's not, a, that's not the answer. We need to opt out everybody. We have to have community-based uh, energy and community-based uh, political action. All right, thank you for, to Camilla Reese for putting that conference on. So I, I really like this slide. This was Timothy's last slide in his presentation, some key questions to be asking. And let me just pause and say that we will be moving as a society in the direction of distributed microgrids without smart meters as soon as we reach a tipping point in awareness. So that's the direction that is, that is happening. It's people producing energy becoming what uh, uh, is being referred to as prosumer, producing energy, consuming energy, sharing it in microgrids. You don't need smart meters to do that. Has the public been misled about technical capabilities of smart meters? Well, you know, you can ask your utility that. Think about that and how have we been misled in so many different ways. Um, is your smart meter really a surveillance drone in your home? What is the futility of smart meter opt-out programs and will they just make the situation worse? Interesting point. Why is the utility industry so desperately pushing back against rooftop solar and net metering? Actually, uh, there was a New York Times, or was it Washington Post or New York Times earlier this year that talked about utilities tactics against those that are pushing for solar. And I think it was in the state of Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, his, uh, this proponent of solar energy, his home was actually um, like firebombed. And there was a utility workers, a utility executive was, was implicated. And it was actually revealed that um, in their meetings, that the utility, uh, not the whole utility industry, but a portion of the utility industry got together and said, how do we deal with these guys? And they, they decided to get tough and use whatever means it, it, it takes. This is actually in the Washington Post, as far as I know. So this is actually happening. Um, why does federal, federal, federal agency energy policy continue to flounder and do local communities need to take control of their energy future? Is the Public Utility Commission regulatory model irreparably broken, obsolete, and does it need to be sunset or retired? And are, are billions of dollars being wasted in the name of smart grid while the genuine smart technical solutions go underfunded? And how can we create a truly wise decentralized electricity grid without the privacy, security, reliability, public health, and economic risks and fires of the present approach. So getting smarter about the smart grid, you can go there and download Timothy's uh, two excellent papers on this. Very profound papers that everyone really doing policy work needs to know about. Okay, February 2014, Ontario Ombudsman investigates systemic billing corruption at Hydro One. I was in touch with his office and let them know about our film. I'm not sure if you know they actually watched it to see that the issue goes far deeper than just systemic billing corruption. But he had more than 10,000 complaints in the province of Ontario uh, from people getting like ridiculous hydro bills. Um, and you see there highlighted, if you can't read it, it says two senior Hydro One executives have just quit. Stepping down, there's gonna be a lot more of that happening. Uh, March 2014, major insurance firm Swiss uh, RE uh, warns of large losses from unforeseen consequences of electromagnetic frequencies on the health side. Major liability risk in the highest category 
Fortune 500 insurance provider. May 2014, ComEd in Chicago raises rates by 38% to pay for smart meters. Uh, July 2014, province of Saskatchewan to replace all 105,000 smart meters to be removed. Um, forgive the grammatical error. And also in July 2014, Portland Gas and Electric, 70,000 meters replaced, fire risk. What are they being replaced with? They're, in those cases, they're being replaced with other smart meters, other manufacturers' smart meters. That's because the public uh, has not demanded otherwise so far. Smart meters are a time bomb for utilities, warns insurance expert. More than 110 municipalities in Quebec now opposed to smart meters, September of last year. Uh, Kim Bendis, featured in Take Back Your Power, victorious in dubious arrest case. Okay, if, if you've seen that film, you know what we're, we're talking about. Uh, that was just, uh, the case was thrown out. Uh, here, okay, showdown in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. I, I like, I, I'm going to include these two clips and, uh, because they, they make good points. And it's, this is happening in communities all around the world where people are coming together and they're, they're bringing this information and awareness and demanding that their smart meter agenda be stopped. And this is just a, a couple of really nice examples and good points they make. Can you pro provide data supporting that $50 figure and also based on the fact that a percentage of that $20.50 base fee went towards reading meters that weren't being read, where did that money go? And can you account for the dollars actually uh, allocated for reading meters that were not read? All right, so moving on, my understanding is staff's going to get back with us, answers to the questions that our members have provided, and come back with different options for us to consider moving forward. Thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Standard utility response, right? Do, do you guys think right now the people who go out and read meters, are they being paid or do they do it for free? Right, they're being paid. October 2014, Ralph Nader on the radio show referred to smart meters as a step towards technological despotism. Um, many people are in positions of power are seeing that. He's starting to talk about it openly. October 2014, also free opt-out in Fountain, Colorado. Again, that's not the solution we want, but people are having uh, success in, in creating change nonetheless. Port Angeles, Washington scraps smart meter program. Uh, in November of last year. That's a municipal utility. Uh, in Ireland, mass movement removing smart water meters. And they said they don't, the, the utility doesn't want you inviting ferries to remove your meter because the, the, the campaign and the people were actually, it was like this, you know, oh, the ferry, the smart meter ferry came. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we can just make that happen everywhere. There's ferries just take over the planet. Um, but in Ireland, uh, it's a unique situation because they were not paying for it. That was included in their taxes. Their water was included in their taxes now. Not only are they installing smart meters, but this is an entirely new charge. So their taxes aren't going down, but they're having new fees to pay for it. Uh, in Ontario, Auditor General, so we saw from the Ombudsman in Ontario earlier, this is the Auditor General, smart meters, a total flop, and 900 million over budget. 1.9 billion to install these things in one province. January 2015, Tech Technocracy Rising, an excellent book released by Patrick Wood, and I encourage everyone to, to go to that website, pick up a copy of that book, and subscribe to his work, because he's been doing amazing work for decades, um, helping us to connect the dots. February 2015, Hydro-Quebec CEO, we saw this earlier, they resigned, and all three of them the same day, 
And also PG&E in California PUC private emails reveal conspiracy and commissioner resigns amidst investigations. So Commissioner Michael PV was being investi investigated by the state and at the federal level for amongst other things, colluding with the CPUC to deploy the smart meter program. And March of this year, Britain's Institute of Directors say smart meters are a government IT disaster waiting to happen. And also in March, hundreds of smart meters sim simultaneously explode at the same time, hundreds of them in Stockton, California. Utility or uh, analog meters have never ever done that. And let's watch the video. A series of explosions in Stockton left thousands of people without power for most of the day. It was enough to kind of shake the house a little bit. These explosions were this morning after a truck crashed into a utility pole, causing a surge. Crews of PG&E have been working diligently to restore the power. CBS 13's Lee Martinez joins us live from Stockton to tell us when crews are expected to have the power back on. Lee? Well, when those customers get their power back on depends on how badly damaged their meters are. I can tell you that 100 PG&E workers are out here trying to restore power to South Stockton, South Stockton customers after an 8.30 a.m. power surge blew up the meters. Almost at once, everyone in the South Stockton area heard it. Loud pop noise, the whole neighborhood could hear. Like a car bomb. It was enough to kind of shake the house. PG&E electricity meters blew out in small explosions outside many of these houses. More than 8,000 homes lost power. The neighbor across the street, his meter doesn't look as bad as ours, but all his receptacles in the whole house are all black. PG&E says a dump truck crashed near its Alpine substation on Arch Road. When the truck hit the utility pole, the top wire fell onto the bottom wire, creating a power surge. So the top lines are considered basically like our freeways. Um, the lower level lines are distribution lines and they take power directly to customers, homes and businesses. So when the two collide, obviously they're at different voltages um, and the higher voltage usually wins out causing an overload. The power will be restored to most customers by 5 p.m. But the damage varies by home. We have the damage as we see other things going to happen you know, soon. Well, getting ready for school, work, and everything else, so everything is on. So what would happen, you know, is everything fried. PG&E is reaching out to those customers to see who needs a replacement meter or panel. Everybody's scared right now. Um, we have, I have an infant. I don't know what to do without any electricity. Got no shower, no more kids. I don't know what we're going to do. Now, PG&E says it wants customers to call the company directly if they have broken meters or any of the electrical sockets have been fried inside to give them a call because they want to try to get out here as quickly as possible to restore power and uh, fix the, the pa panels here. Let's hope they can get it done as quickly as possible. Lee Martinez, live in Stockton Forest. Lee, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> that was the fourth simultaneous explosion, mass explosion of multiple smart meters. In all cases, at least dozens or more. That was the fourth one um, that we know of. That we know of. In Arizona, APS rescinds opt-out fees, fearing liability. In April of this year, in May, Indiana PUC rejects Duke Energy's plan to install smart meters. So now we're starting to see some positive indication. Um, in May, in the UK, hundreds of thousands of smart meters um, in smart meter billing limbo. So the billing system, like we saw in Ontario and everywhere else where bills are going up, it's not working. Bills are going up and there's technical billing issues in addition to the increase and in the people are paying. <clears throat> okay, May, another hundred smart meters spontaneously explode, this time in Capitola. In June, free opt-out in Woodstock. Again, you know, not what we're going for, but those people are standing up and they're Fighting the good fight. Um, in July, more PC, this is interesting, more PG&E CPUC emails come to light revealing conspiracy and fear of people taking action. This is part one of two screens on this. So Brian Cherry from PG&E, this is relating to that, um, previously we saw the state and federal investigations. We want to eliminate the upfront uh, opt-out fee, says Brian Cherry from PG&E. The CPUC says, you are suggesting that other rate payers eat the cost or PG&E itself? Uh, Brian says, we could collect it in uh, ERA fees or Energy Regulatory Regional Association instead. 
And Maria says, I think if there is not an initial fee, your estimate of 2% opt-out goes out the door and you'll have more likely 20 or 50% opt-out, which will then make the whole project that we spent over $7 billion on a complete and total waste. <laughs> so these guys are understanding that they're under-delivering, that there's problems, that maybe it wasn't the best choice, just like our you know, insider friend at the DOE said, right? But they're... They're protecting their bad decision. We really need to see this. They don't have anything to lose right now. They're not going to jail yet. They're not co commercially, financially liable yet. Well, that's happening. Uh, also in July, this is the second screen. This is another issue. Okay, J James Meadows from pg and &E. Here is the guy with a $50 meter replacement kit, freedomtaker.com. Another great website. Jerry Day, who's in Take Back Your Power, has been a outstanding advocate in this issue for several years now. So they're aware of this, people having the, the, the know-how and the instructions to how to replace their meter. Brian Cherry from pg and &E says, uh, Marja, the C CPUC rep, please go to the website and view the video. These guys claim they have a legal right to do this. I'm checking whether th uh, that is true. I'm not sure. But this is one of the worries if we have to start charging for removal. Maria says, Yes, I am frustrated, but you have to convince the fifth floor, not me. Brian says, listen to the damn video first. Thanks. <laughs> so they're, they're obviously concerned about, you know, a solution getting out and people becoming activated. So to speed up the world saving process, here's what we need. We need industry executives with a backbone to say no. If you're watching this and you're working for the industry, you know what to do. <laughs> And you can do it, and we're here to support. There's a whole movement. They're just you know, coming into uh, a, a large expansion at this time that are very willing to support. Industry whistleblowers, we need you to um, speak up at this time. Think about your legacy, your future generations. You will be supported. Come on, guys. Okay, so is a meta solution possible? Before we get into this, okay, everybody, take a, a few breaths, stand up. And just do a, do a couple stretches because we're shifting gears here. We're, we're, we're changing the energy. So just maybe, you know, do a couple. Uh, okay. All right. Now we're ready. <laughs> so is a meta solution, is a meta solution possible? And what do I mean by meta solution? Let's have a look. So let's be honest, we're not where we want to be. We saw those positive indications of maybe, in some cases, limited victories in the movement so far. But what's happening is hundreds of municipalities, cities, and, and counties have called for a moratorium on so-called smart meters, but utilities usually install anyway. And opt-outs, even if free, are not an acceptable solution. We know that. Opt-outs are a great way to silence all those in the fight. Utilities are using attrition tactics to wear down holdouts. So like paperwork bouncing back and forth. You know, do, do you agree yet? Do you agree yet? Do you agree yet? That's literally what they're saying. Everything they're doing is a contract offer. And if you can just, you know, hold out and, and realize that um, they're doing this out of fear and they're trying to get you to agree to their contract by either saying yes or remaining silent. That's been the, the strategy so far. So we're, we're taking that to the next level. We're not leaving that door infinitely open to them to keep harassing um, those who don't want to participate with the program. Traditional legal processes, appeals, complaints, and other class action lawsuits are not working and are so far playing into the hands of the utilities. For example, establishing legal precedent or confirming that a certain governing body is the authority. So there's obviously corruption. Courts are not, in many cases, they're not even hearing um, the truth and the facts of the issue. They're just throwing it out. And in some cases, that's actually like a dog and pony show. Like in um, uh, Chicago this past week, um, there was a case there, and um, I just had time to look at it in, in detail, and a friend was updating me on it. But what happened was the judge ruled that utilities can, uh, can harvest and collect all the private data, all the surveillance data. They can, they can uh, collect that, but... Uh, because there's no uh, proof that they're actually using it. So this is, this is how laws are being 
uh, interpreted in, in corrupt courtrooms. So that is now attempting to set a precedent of normalcy for other courts, for other um, you know, activist uh, regions and groups. So that's the lie. That's their corporate jurisdiction we're going to talk about here in, in the, the next part. So those committing harm have little to lose right now. They're getting away with it. You know, it's like a corrupt judicial system, uh, corporately owned media, and the watchdog has left the building, and so has the enforcer. Really, all of our watchdog agencies appear to either be misinformed on, on, on this issue or not able to do anything about it. So they're corporately controlled in many, many cases now. So, you know, where does that leave us? Well, we now are being called to take an active role in this, each, each one of us. And each one of us can do it, and you'll see how in a moment. Criticals protect, criminals protecting criminals means everyone in the club gets power and money. You know, so it's, I won't say any, any more about that perhaps, but I think you all get a sense of, and not just in the smart meter issue, but you know, there's a general wake up happening that um, governments are not really what they appear to be. Uh, bucking the system means ri uh, a risk to job or a roadblock to becoming, uh, and is a roadblock to becoming part of the solution. That's been the, the case for many that have wanted to speak out. We're kind of, they're, they're kind of conflicted because they want to keep their job. And their language is money. Okay, so however, awareness and dis dissatisfaction is an all-time high. This is the other side of this coin. The more corruption is happening, the more revelation of truth is happening. And more pe people are seeing it's obvious. Corporatism and its harm are becoming increasingly obvious to everyone. Um, for example, uh, Obama's rating is now lower than George Bush's was. And I believe that was the New York Times that said that, um, though don't quote me on that. Uh, reporters in the mainstream media are beginning to get out of the box and are starting to ask hard questions. And here's one from last year. New York Times reporter calls Obama the greatest enemy of press freedom in a generation. And just this past month, um, there was an additional group of, uh, of um, reporters basically echoing that thought. So some states now, in fact, are moving away from federal government dictates. And Arizona is one of those. They just passed two bills aimed at blocking federal laws. And people are increasingly ready for truth. You know, really be everyone who's becoming aware of this issue and everyone in this room really be encouraged that you can now speak truth and it's being received more and more. Like how many people are having, you know, synchronicities and things are just, you know, new things are happening in your life despite, right? Like a lot of people in this room, despite what appears to be an agenda that wants to overtake our rights, there's like something new that's happening. There's synchronicities and we're ready for that whatever it is to be revealed for us, so we're ready for truth. As an example, this is from Collective Evolution. Um, this one got 31,000 shares. Collective Evolution is an awesome uh, website and uh, Facebook page. I think they have several hundred thousand likes, and uh, if not more. And um, they have made several films about sustainability and about rights. So this is something that I say, when, when you are born, your parents register you with the government as a corporation by receiving and signing a birth certificate. In a few years, your corporation will receive a taxpayer ID number called a social security number, NIS number, IRD number, et cetera, depending on where you are. This is so you can be used as collateral for the government to acquire debt. Your labor, time, and energy backs up the national debt to acquire collateral on debt. You are stock. And that, so this is something that you know, it's kind of out of the box, but what we're seeing socially is it's getting shared by huge numbers of people and people are waking up to the fact that a corporate bait and switch of a huge uh, magnitude has been played out, especially in the last hundred years. So getting back, um, people need solutions that work. Most active humans experience a form of corruption overload. So we're kind of getting tired now of hearing of all the corruption, all the, problem, the problems we want to, you know, do something about it. Give us solutions, make it organized, make it easy. As an example, um, this is the International Tribunal for Natural, Natural Justice, ratified July 1st, 2015. 
Now, what they are doing, they're operating in a jurisdiction above the traditional legal corporate jurisdiction, and they're actually starting to try, as criminals, some of the perpetrators of the great harms on the planet. This is an international uh, movement, and uh, this is a very exciting development. So two critical points uh, about the smart meter issue. The first is consent or non-consent, and realizing that we have that right. We don't have to succumb to a reality being dictated to us. And the second is liability. We have uh, the ability to enforce both. Uh, a maxim of law, I won't try to read that Latin, but what it means is equity aids the vigilant, not those who sleep on their rights. So if we have the ability to do something, if we have rights, they're not automatically protected because there's other agencies that are trying to get our contract, our agreement for what they want to do. And as long as we're silent, according to their codes, Uniform Commercial Code, as long as we're silent, after 10 days, we agree. Okay, so wrapping up the bigger picture. There... I believe that there's a significant wake-up happening in our world right now. Um, on one side, there's corporate government corruption, surveillance. People are realizing the surveillance, the, money, the whole money system is corrupt. It's based on nothing. Private bankers own the Fed. There's insane laws, indefinite detention. You know, what is that? Suppression of energy technology, uh, geoengineering, etc. cetera. Uh, health issues, GMOs, electromagnetic radiation, vaccines, fluoridation, all being pushed by the same corporate complex. Rights, on the positive side, we're remembering and we're reconnecting with who we are. We're remembering that we have a higher aspect. And we're realizing through teaching of, you know, the types of teachers, but what we just saw in that clip, about jurisdictions but we've kind of been conned to think that we're less, both with respect to our identity and legally with respect to our rights. We've been kind of in this lower jurisdiction and how to get out of that and effective remedies. And the realization that changing politicians is like changing oil in a car that doesn't run, right? Our individual purpose is clarifying. Again, we're remembering who we are, what we're here to participate in, and what we're here to create. Organizing and uh, so self-organizing is happening. People are coming together. We're finding each other. Those of us who are on this path and have chosen the path of, of uh, moving through the fear to the solution, we're coming together and synchronicities are happening in our individual lives and collectively. And so on one hand, the control agenda appears to be moving uh, full steam ahead. I mean, it's really easy just to look through the, my, my email inbox, I don't know about yours, but um, in the corporate media, obviously they're pushing the fear and dis disempowerment both. But it's easy to look through that and just get overwhelmed, isn't it? So, speaking of overwhelm, let's just look at this one clip and just realize, you know, we're moving through this, we're not staying here, this is one man's vision of how he wants to see society. More directly linked to the impact of technology if the technocratic society involve, invo sorry, it, the technocratic society, involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled and directed society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite whose claim to political power would rest on an allegedly superior scientific know-how. Allegedly, that's what we're seeing in the electromagnetic radiation issue. Unhindered by the restraints of traditional liberal values, this elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. So that was written, that's Zbigniew Brzezinski in his book, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. There's other juicy quote, quotes in that book. That's 1970. Here's the man. So he's the man behind Obama's foreign policy. Okay, so on the other hand, people are gaining courage and entire nations are beginning to separate from central banking control. 
Last week in Greece, uh, thousands, 61% said no to the EU, said no to their fictitious um, debt of uh, unknown, you know, I don't even know how many, do you know how much billions of dollars it was? Yeah, however many. It was a massive amount of debt. Just like Iceland did several years ago, Greece is following suit now. They said no. People were celebrating in the streets. It was a political landslide. Anything more than 60% in a referendum vote is a landslide. And, of course, the media writes it up. Emergency summit called. Okay, it's a problem. It's, they don't know what they're doing. It's an emergency. No, they're, they're celebrating because they're realizing. What are they realizing? I am Hörður Torvason. I come from Iceland. I am a person who belongs to no political parties, nor religious ones. And uh, I'm the person who started like kind of a, uh, well, a revolution in Iceland on the 6th of October 2008. And I kept it running with three demands for five months. That is to say, we, we got away the government, we got a new government and uh, people in high places that had been very corrupt. We are all dealing with the same problem worldwide. This is a globalization of few companies and IMF. We are fighting for our lives. We have a choice. Either we accept these conditions or we fight it. We don't fight it with riots, we don't fight it with fire, we don't fight it with, with violence. To deal with the non-violence part, what I did in Iceland, and they started throwing rocks at the police, but the people wearing orange walked in front and made a wall in front of the police to show we mean this. This was a very beautiful thing to do because people were throwing rocks. And, and I think in, in that part, we won the heart of the police. We fight it with reasons, information. We have the technology, we have the brains to do it, so let's do it. And every, each and every one of us has a part in it. To the Greek people, you have an option. Give up or fight, but fight with your brains. This is about our lives and the future of the children, of the generations, of the young people today. I mean, what's their future as it is? To the Greek politicians, listen to your people. You are working for the people, not for your private situation. Greek people, all over the world, people are following what you are doing. We are aware of it and we send our love and we say to you, we are fighting with you and give strong messages to the politicians to do their jobs. When they are aware of you, they think, ah, these are my votes, so I better do something for them. Make them aware of this. We are people all around the globe doing this. So join us. We are with you in our hearts and in our minds. Good luck. Thank you. Sorry. I think when we get aligned with our, what we're here to do, it's like something new emerges, you know, like a new energy. And sometimes it's hard for it to parse that, so forgive me. Um, a new type of thinking, this is the actual quote. You've heard of variations of this before, but I actually looked up. A new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move toward higher levels. Albert Einstein. The old way of creating change no longer works. Aligned with Newtonian physics is the old activism. Anger, frustration, 
matter, it's matter based, as you can see, uh, fueled by ego or shadow, the lower energies in our, in our being, in our consciousness. And it's an energetic turnoff for people. You know, it might look impressive on the evening news to see rah, rah, rah. Oh, yeah, those people are doing something. But if you see that, you're not attracted uh, generally to, to, to join anger based movements. And to do effective outer work, inner work is required. This is something that I'm realizing myself. And I'm just sharing this aspect of my own per, uh, journey with you. So it's instead aligned with a shift to quantum physics or consciousness-based physics where the observer actually changes the reality of it. And um, sacred activism is a concept talked about by Andrew Harvey or conscious activism. So really we're re-engaging all of the spiritual community around the planet that are kind of have been sickened by what's going on in the mainstream with the corporatization. And now they're coming back in now. Now this is the time to come back in actually, into, the, into the, the work, the activism. And Andrew Harvey, I encourage you, um, there's a talk that he gave with Marianne Williamson last year. It's called Love's Manifesto. And you can get a copy of it. He's giving it away, basically. It's on Amazon, I think, for $3. The first copy is for 3 bucks, and so it's normal price after then. This is a profound seven-CD set all about merging spirit and activism. It's, it's profound. Um, so this is fueled by life and serves the highest good. So it's an octave higher than, you know, if ego-based and shadow-based uh, activism is here, then this is now we're serving love and protecting life. And it attracts people. People, you know, the, the further that people kind of go off track and society goes off track, the more we are attracted to the, the truth of a thing and the, the love of, in life. I want to thank um, everyone here for sharing their time with me in, in person. I want to thank you if you're watching this um, at home when it's released online. And uh, we invite you to be part of this, this journey and experience. It's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you.